Hello and welcome to the Majlis Central Asia podcast at Radio Free Europe Radio Liberty. I'm Mohammed Tahir, your host here in Washington, D.C. As Shokat Mirziyaev's presidency enters to six months, mixed signals are coming out from Uzbekistan. Uzbek government previously known with harsh treatment of independent civil society members, the current leadership has recently released a number of activists. This move was received as a positive signal by Uzbekistan watchers, but while the news was still being celebrated, Tashkent's recent decision to detain another prominent human rights activist, Elena Orlaeva, raises serious questions about Tashkent's real motives. Now the question is how to understand release of some activists and the detention of Orlaiva. Is it the scenario described as a one step ahead and two step backward? To make sense of all these, I'm joined by Steve Severtlo, Human Rights Watch's Central Asia researcher. Uh, Steve, welcome to the Majlis. Thanks for having me. Very nice to have you. Omida Niazova is joining us from Germany. Uh, she's the director of the Uzbek German Forum for Human Rights. Omida, welcome to the Majlis. Thank you. Very nice to have you. Bruce Panier is joining us, who is the editor of Kishlok Awazi, Radio Free Europe, Radio Liberty, Central Asia blog. Bruce, welcome to the Majlis. Thank you. Okay, uh, let's start from uh, good news. Uh, over the past few weeks, we have seen a number of prominent uh, detainees being released. Uh, let's recall their names and background first, as much as we know. Uh, can we start, Steve, uh, from you? I mean, it has been a momentous six months in terms of the, certainly for the families of those activists who, who were released and for those activists themselves. Um, starting in, in, in August and September, we saw the first released was Bobo Murod Razakov, activist in Bukhara who represented the Human Rights Society as Gulik. Then we saw in September, October period, we saw an interesting development with the release of Samandar Kukhanov, mm. who was a very prominent, p- perhaps after Nelson Mandela, he may have, may have been the longest imprisoned political prisoner in the world. He had been in prison since 1993. He had been in parliament, and he was, along with some of the others that we'll mention, had been someone that Islam Karimov considered a personal enemy of, of his. And, and many people read into his release that Mirzoev was doing away with old feuds and was trying to send a message that he was going to change tactics and certainly that he wasn't going to keep persecuting those who were Karimov's personal enemies. And Kukhanov's release was actually quite notable for another reason. In his case, his case had been extended arbitrarily, his prison term by three years, as has happened in many of the cases of the long-term p- political prisoners. And following the extension of his sentence by another three years, that would have extended him to, I think, uh, 27 years in prison, something absolutely ridiculous, we actually saw in a break from, from the routine practice, we saw the U.S. Embassy go on record and publicly ask for his release on humanitarian grounds, which is not something that Washington does very often, and, and certainly we, we praise that step at Human Rights Watch. We're often calling on, on the EU and the U.S. to be very public in their calls for release. They did so, and within a few weeks, we actually saw Kukanov's extension reversed, and we saw him released. Uh, he was elderly, obviously he'd been in prison for about a quarter century, and, and in ill health, but still released. Uh, following his case, we saw another individual, Rustam Usmanov, who had been in prison for 19 years. He was the founder of Uzbekistan's first private bank and was a vocal supporter of the Erk Party, an opposition party. Uh, we saw him released, and in his case, also very, very much associated with Karimov's early years, his, his destruction of the secular political opposition in the early 90s. And not too long after that, we saw you know, probably... The, the biggest news for, for, for many who have been following this for, for many years was the release of the world's longest imprisoned journalist, Mohamed Bekjanov, who was in prison since 1999 and who had been kidnapped from Ukraine and brought back to Uzbekistan. He was or is the brother of Mohamed Salih, probably the biggest opponent uh, there could have been or is of, of Islam Karimov and of the Uzbek government. And of course, that was a very momentous um, occasion because many people believe that Mirzoev could release others, but how could he possibly release the brother of, of probably the most hated enemy of the Uzbek government? But he, he did so. Bekjanov 
also had spent so many years in prison, was very ill, had gone deaf in one ear, had been tortured. And then we saw the nephew of Islam Karimov released from a psychiatric facility where he had been, his story is quite complicated. He had earlier been in detention and released in 2011. He's a journalist, uh, but was re-arrested and re-detained and, and, and held in a, in a psychiatric facility. So all of those were very momentous. But in most of these cases, we have to note that none of these releases were actually early releases. None of these individuals were released before their terms were up. They all served out their terms. And in many cases, had served out extended, arbitrarily extended sentences. So in some ways, you could argue that Mirzoyev was quite lucky because his coming to power coincided with the end of the prison terms of many of these high-profile cases, and he was simply able to say, you know what, I'm not going to extend them anymore. But he didn't actually have to release them prior to their, prior to their, their terms. And in fact, in many cases, these are individuals who were very elderly, very sick, and probably couldn't pose any sort of threat of uh, very energetic activism. Interesting. I, when you were talking, Steve, I was also thinking, is it um, kind of a, an effort on behalf of Mirziyoyev to come clean from Karimov's legacy? Well, it certainly had to take, he had to spend a certain amount of political capital to embark on these releases. And certainly releasing Mohammed Bikjan, Samandar Kukhanov, Rustam Usmanov, these are names that, you know, among the Uzbek elite, yeah. uh, many would still recognize as very important players. And, you know, we can't know the full extent of how fierce these battles were, these conversations were with the security services or to what extent there was disagreement. Mm -hmm. But it probably did take, it certainly took Mirzoev's personal involvement and personal approval. We know that in the case of Bikjanov. And, and, you know, certainly I'm sure there were some that disagreed with his steps. Yeah, we will come back to this topic. First, uh, Omida, release of so many activists in a short uh, period of time, was it a surprise to you? Um... I would not say that this surprised me, and uh, I I want to note that, uh, as Steve said, that Mirziyev, he has not just released them, the activists and um, journalists. They already spent in prison all this um, their detention term, so he had a, so he should choose even uh, to release them or to give the order to prolong their detention term. And uh, it's good that he he decided uh, not not to prolong that term. And uh, in other hand, yes, these people, these activ activists, released activists, most of them are very ill, old people. They're not actively, and most likely they will be not actively involved in any like civil or political activity in the future. So that's why for Mirziyaev to release them, it cost it costed nothing. But it is in his favor that the uh, detention term was ended this time. Hmm. Interesting. Bruce, uh, let me bring you in there. Other than uh, length of their detention, uh, what do you think they have in common? I'm talking about the people who, who were released uh, recently. Well, uh, you know, I think both Steve and Umida have, have uh, mentioned that one, they were all old. You know, and so they, they at this point, uh, especially uh, except for Razakov, who'd only been in for a couple of years, but the other ones had been in for pr in prison for a very, very long time. And and so there really wasn't mu much of a danger from letting them out, you know, and again, they, again, with the exception of Razakov, they had, uh, they'd all served their terms. I think Razakov actually got was supposed to be in for a few months more, maybe even a year or something like that. And he hadn't he hadn't been in a huge it had been in three years, four years or something, I think, before this. But but otherwise, yeah, I mean they were all elderly. They were in not very good health. Uh, at this point, as you would imagine, after being in an Uzbek jail for, you know, two decades, uh, on the average. And and so there really wasn't much, you know, uh, danger in letting these people go at this time, especially since their their terms were were really up. Uh, that's really the big link between the three of them. Otherwise, you know, um, uh, there's not that the two of them were active. Well, one one was an activist. One was an activist in the sense that he was a pol politically involved. And and then of course, uh, Muhammad Bakjan was a was a journalist who happens to be a relative of uh, Muhammad Salih. So the, they don't compare in that respect too much. You just have to look at it as age and the sentence was served. And and of course, the, you know, the Uzbek government got 
uh, it made them look really good that they released all these uh, that these people because their names had been well known and, and uh, rights organizations like Human Rights Watch and others had had mentioned their names for years and years as people who should never have been put in jail and should be released. So it, it made Mirzioyev's administration look good that they finally did release these people. Uh, you know, but as has been said, there's there's many people who are much younger who have, who are in jail for equally absurd reasons, uh, and there's been no mention of letting them out at all. Let's talk a little bit about those, uh, Bruce, that you mentioned, people who are still in jail. Um, yes, we will talk in length about Elena in the second part of the show, but who are the other people who still remain in jail? Who wants to jump in? You know, I'm going to give this to Steve because he's been doing excellent work documenting them, and he can go over these people much better than I can. Steve? Yeah, well, I mean, as Bruce said, there are thousands of people in prison on politically imp- motivated charges. The vast majority of them are, are peaceful religious believers, and, you know, many of them... We don't know their names, uh, although thanks to the to the yeoman's work of, of Memorial and and other researchers like Surat Ikramov over the years, we have been able to compile you know many many dozens and hundreds of names uh, of people on 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 religious charges. I mean, for example, Article 159, which uh, criminalizes uh, unconstitutional attempts to to overthrow the state, a very vague charge and other religious extremism charges, 242, 221. But we can focus also on the other category, for example, human rights defenders, journalists, political activists, of which there are dozens at least, if not if not, you know, up to maybe 100 uh, people. We have people like Salih John Abdurrahmanov, a reporter from Karakal, Pakistan. Mohammed Bikjanov, when he was released, he, he called on Mirzoev to release his colleagues. We have... Uh, Dilmorod Saidov, we have Agzab Turgunov, uh, reporters and activists. You know, we have uh, many hundreds of people that were arrested in the aftermath of the Andijan massacre, huh. who fled those events, who were witnesses to those events in 2005, who were sentenced in trials, a group sort of collective trial, show trials, where they were tortured in, in the most horrific manner and then paraded on television. We have you know, many, many different categories. In, in a way, it's a very complicated and complex portrait of, of Uzbek society. Uh, we also have Azam Farmonov, another human rights defender whose extension of sentence was just upheld uh, in recent weeks by the Uzbek courts. And that was another blow, uh, going back to what you first said, Mohammed, at the beginning about is this one step forward, two, two, two steps back. We do seem to have a zigzag effect. We have, have various courts, local authorities, the SNB, Mirzioyev, all sort of taking taking different decisions. But we have, you know, in a way, though, Mirzioyev is, was very smart in releasing Bikjanov because Bikjanov had really garnered probably the most significant attention in the last several years as the world's longest imprisoned journalist. Although we, we have to not forget Yusuf Ruzi Muradov, who was kidnapped with him, tried with him, and also tortured and has also been in prison for 17 years. It's just that we don't actually have photos of him. So, you know, in many of these cases, we, we lack a lot of the, the forensic data, the photographic imagery to make campaigning easier on behalf of these people. And so we have to work harder. And, you know, one thing I hope is that researchers like me will be able to go to Uzbekistan and raise these cases now directly with, with the government if, if they mean what they say about being serious on, on making reforms. Um, Omita, does anyone come to your mind in terms of the ones who still remain in jail at this stage? Obviously, there are thousands of people with like, some prominent name, if you yeah. remember. Yeah, we have a list of something like 12 from the 15 um, human rights activists and journalists who are in jail now. And um, I can mention the two of, uh, of my colleagues, Azam Parmonov and Azam Turkunov, who I met actually just a few days before they've been arrested. Uh, for example, Azam Parmonov, he, is a, he was a prominent human rights activist from Kulistan City, and he was sentenced to, um, he spent already 10 years in the um, just League prison for the, so the formally, he was charged with extortion of the sum of $300. And um, last year, his um, uh, detention term was prolonged for another five years. 
So again, we have Soli John Abdurrahman of the journalist from Karakal, Pakistan. So these people, they must be released immediately. They must be released today. So before these people are in prison, of course, we can't say that Mirza Yaev are really dedicated or wanted to, to reform something. Bruce, we have heard from Steve and Omida about a uh, number of people who are still in jail. It's hard to uh, read uh, Mirziyoyev's mind, but what is your best guess on what were the determining factor to let some people go and keep the others inside? Well, you know, it's, it seems pretty clear to me that he's letting go of the older harmless guys. Uh, that, you know, in any case, their their service, their jail terms were pretty much were ended or, or were coming to an end uh, where he's not he's not releasing any of the people who are more who are younger and, and probably more energetic and and might indeed return to activism work of some kind or another um, so uh, I, th- I think he just selected some of the high profile names the people that have been there in the longest time and represented the least threat to the state uh, at this moment and decided to leave the, to let them out and I'll, I'll mention a couple other names that weren't mentioned in there Israel Kaldarov uh, from the Eric Party, who was also wrongfully arrested and spent ten years in jail, uh, you know, for no good reason at all. Uh, at least as Gulik got to see him in September, um, and the Armenian farmer Avakian, uh, Armeis Avakian, I believe, uh, and mm-hmm. who was, of course, arrested. He's a Christian Armenian who was arrested for being uh, a sympathetic or a member of the Islamic State militant group uh, in what appears to have been purely a dispute over, or, or essentially a property grab by a local official. Uh, and he's, he's, he should never have been put in jail either, uh, and you don't hear his name coming up at all from any officials. Hmm. I, would, I would add to what Bruce is saying in that part of the strategy also seems to be releasing those who are maybe, maybe you know subscribe to the secular category of activism or journalists although as umida and bruce said many many of them are still languishing in prison but certainly as to the vast majority of religious believers you know probably 95 percent of the political prisoner population we have very little information that, that that any of those individuals have been released and and in fact the you know we are receiving more information all the time at human rights watch about new arrests of people on very vague charges of religious extremism all over the country in cities like fergana and 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 margilan especially in the, in the fergana valley this often happens and we also get consistent reports that the terms of those people on those charges are, are arbitrarily extended. So it is a very, very vast, vast population of people. So it's a microcosm of Uzbekistan and Uzbek society because you have business people, entrepreneurs, artists, poets, religious believers, activists, lawyers, all who sort of you know enter into the crosshairs of the Uzbek regime and, and end up in this terrible situation and their voices are not being heard. And, and as Umida said, Mirzoyev could release all of these people with the stroke of a pen. And, and in the cases of those that the state uh, suspects of some connection to extremism, the call that Human Rights Watch has been making for years is that the Uzbek government should create some sort of impartial mechanism, uh, release these people. And if you actually have credible allegations uh, or suspicions of extremism, then you need to try them in a more objective way. Uh, certainly any confessions obtained through torture would have to be excluded as evidence. But you'd have to create the conditions for credible examinations into any sort of criminal allegations, but at the same time release these people and regain the trust and the confidence of, of Uzbek society and the international community on this issue. Uh-huh. Thank you, uh, Steve. Yes, uh, while release of many individuals uh, detained with prompted uh, charges is a, is a good move and something that never should have happened in the first place, but with one step ahead, it seems Uzbekistan, Uzbek authorities are taking few steps back. In this light, how to understand prominent anti-force labor campaigner Elena Orlaiva's detention? who was never detained uh, by Karimov, with, despite all of his uh, brutal campaign against human rights activists. So we will continue Majlis discussing this and many other uh, relevant questions shortly. Hey everyone, before we get into the second part of the show, just a quick reminder that if you really like Majlis podcast, there's a chance that you will also like my other radio show that's called Gandhara Podcast. The show discusses latest developments in Pakistan and Afghanistan from local perspective. And the podcast is published in every second week on Radio Free Europe Radio Liberty's Gandhara website. It's a totally must-follow discussion for foreign policy nerds with interest in the region. 
first, let me recap the debate that today on the Majlis, Radio Free Europe, Radio Liberty, Central Asia podcast, we are trying to make sense of Mirziyoyev's recent steps to release some prominent activists and detaining others. Joining me in the discussion are Steve Severlu, Human Rights Watch's Central Asia researcher, Umida Niyazova, director of the Uzbek uh, German Forum for Human Rights, Bruce Panier, editor of Kishlok Awazi, Radio Free Europe, Radio Liberty, Central Asia blog. I'm Mohammed Tahir, host of the Majlis here in Washington, D.C. Welcome back, uh, ladies and gentlemen. As touched in the first half of the debate with uh, some good news, recently we received a very bad news, alarming news, about the detention of a, a prominent uh, anti-forced labor campaigner, Elena Orlyayeva. So what do we know uh, about the circumstances in which she was arrested? Uh, Omida, do you like to jump in? Yes, um, so uh, Elena Orlyayeva, the bravest, and most active human rights uh, activist. Um, she was arrested on um, March 1st uh, uh, in the house of um, of a man uh, whom Yelena was helping to write complaints. Uh, it was his personal assurance. Uh, and uh, according to him, to, the, to this man, his name is Kamalidin, two policemen uh, came to his house they uh, tied Yelena's hands by force, put her into a car, and drove away. And uh, uh, the same evening, a man who introduced himself as a doctor at the psychiatric clinic, he called Yelena's son and said that uh, Yelena had been admitted for uh, compulsory treatment. And uh, so I wanted to say that I know I have known Yelena for more than 15 years, and she's a very dedicated person, perhaps too dedicated. And she doesn't hesitate to help anyone who comes to her. And uh, you you told that uh, during the Karimov um, time she was not uh, detained, but um, this is not the case. Actually, mm. during uh, all these years, uh, we have uh, lost count of how many times she has been arrested, she has been beaten. And I remember very well and uh, about 15 years ago um, when Yelena was standing on the street the, like a man who most likely is an agent, he kicked Yelena in her stomach yeah. with all his strength in front of my eyes. So the trauma she she has been suffered means that sometimes Yelena needs uh, medical psychiatric help. We have to be clear with this, but this, however, doesn't undermine or discredit your human rights work. And uh, the uh, most disgusting aspect of this case is that Uzbek authorities are taking advantage of uh, Yelena's um, uh, vulnerability. So when they don't know how to silence her, they simply uh, detain her in a psychiatric clinic. So uh, still, so far, uh, there is no uh, court decision or explanation why she has been detained and why she needs to be isolated, um, even without the consent of her close relatives, your son and mother. Uh-huh. Previous uh, harassments and uh, temporary detentions aside, I thought that uh, this is the first uh, serious situation that uh, she's faced with. So you are saying that uh, this harassment has never ended. It's so sad. I mean, she was not in prison, yeah. like she was not sent to prison, uh-huh. but uh, this is the third time when she was being illegally kept in the uh-huh. psychiatric uh, uh-huh. hospital. So last year, in March 2016, she was also detained and sent uh, to the hospital, and she spent four months being iso- isolated. Uh, uh, uh. Maybe, Steve, uh, you jump in here. Uh, as uh, Omida said, it's hard to know why she was uh, detained, because authorities won't explain anything uh, about this. So what is your best guess, why she was detained? Well, you know, I think what it does show, I mean, Yelena's case is a test whether or not there has really been meaningful change in in Mirzoyev, Mirzoyev Uzbekistan in terms of rule of law, in terms of free expression. And, and I think as we alluded to in the first segment, the people that were released, the sort of drop in the, the bucket in, in this vast sea of political imprisonment are individuals that largely have sort of left the scene. And Yelena is the exact opposite. She's the most engaged citizen voice on every issue can, you can think of. When I was in Uzbekistan, you know, she would introduce me to victims of torture. And uh, as Bruce and I recently detailed in, in, in a piece about Yelena, yeah. you know, she was so fearless 
she was constantly we were constantly being visited by police officers uh, coming to the door and it just it never phased her she knew that she was under surveillance all the time you know and and about two years ago about a year and a half ago she had one of the most brutal experiences you could imagine when she was out in the cotton fields she was detained brought to a police station where she was not only interrogated and detained and forcibly sedated but she was sexually humiliated and, and as as Umida says she still continues to go out and do her best she was supposed to have a meeting with the World Bank and the ILO to discuss the results of the monitoring work that she's been doing to discuss the cotton harvest, which is, in a way, it's the the primary issue at the moment of discussion in the international community. And of course, the SNB wanted to silence her and, and stop her from speaking. And I think really what it shows is that so far, as of yet, the government has not really made a decision that it's ready to tolerate any sort of critical voices. And you would think that Yelena Orlaeva would not only uh, be allowed to, to do her work, but that in fact, in this new era, if Mirzoev really wanted to show that he was breaking with the past, that she'd actually be awarded. She'd actually be given you know, facilities to do her work. She'd be allowed uh, resources to register her human rights alliance, that she would be recognized by not only by the U.S. Embassy, which has given her awards and, and other organizations like ours over the years, but that the Uzbek government would actually start to say, you know what, we have mistreated you in the past, and we really appreciate the contribution that you, Yelena Orlova are single-handedly making on right. so many issues. I mean, that would be what, what the Uzbek government should do if it right. wanted to show that it was actually turning turning a new leaf. Mm. This is indeed uh, a very concerning news, uh, Bruce, particularly because uh, she was one of the powerful forces, as Steve was saying, in fighting against forced labor, particularly uh, forced child labor uh, in the cotton fields of Uzbekistan. And her detention comes when Mirziyayev is coming to power as a president, who's known as, uh, as one of the architects of the uh, forced uh, cotton labor uh, strategy. Any connection between Mirziyayev's race to presidency and her detention? Well, I wouldn't want to say that, that that there was a direct connection between Mirziyayev coming up to president and, and her being detained. You know, as as we've mentioned, um, she was she has been detained so many times and committed to psychiatric hospitals uh, forcibly in the past. What I would say is, you know, this is there is a connection with what we were talking about in the first half of the show that he has let some people go. Uh, you know, and these people are not expected to to re- resume their uh, activism when they get up there. So, it, uh, like Steve said, she was due to meet with with some people, some outsiders who were coming in to assess the the situation in Uzbekistan. But uh, um, I think I think the Mirziyoyev and his heir, someone in his administration, certainly wanted to make the point that uh, although we've let some people out. Uh, we are still pursuing the same policies, more or less, as we did under Karimov. We, we're not interested in seeing people become more uh, involved in public activism, uh, going out and challenging the government, criticizing policies, things like that. If you had to pick one person to send a message to the whole society of Uzbekistan uh, by putting them, committing them, or putting them behind bars, whatever, uh, you know, this was this is one of the people you would pick and say, you know, uh, you, we're putting Yelena alive, uh, force, you know, putting her back in psychiatric hospital. So anyone that gets any ideas about the system loosening up inside the country or anything like that, you know, it's not. And here's your example. Uh, she's, you know, we're putting her, committing her to a psychiatric ward for a while. Uh, so no one has any illusions about their ability to to now go out and and challenge the government on some of the many policy uh, many policies that that should actually be changed. Let's put a face on this uh, brave citizen. Uh, earlier, uh, Steve, you mentioned some of your interactions with her. Who is she? Tell us some more about your interactions with uh, Orlya. Well, you know, Yelena is just um, a. a a force of nature. She is, you know, witty, uh, warm, extremely kind, you know, sort of in a way, you know, she's almost like that aunt that you just love. Um, you know, she she doesn't have airs about her. She's uh, she's really, truly part of the proletariat. You know, when you meet Yelena, um, she is just so amazingly down to earth. You know, I, I know I know little about her life before her activism because she's just so larger than life um, since she came to the scene about about 15 years ago in in civil society. And she has just been an invaluable friend and partner, not just to me at Human Rights Watch, but to everybody at Human Rights Watch who has been following Uzbekistan for so long now. When I met with her, as I said, in 2010, 
she took me in, um, even though she didn't know me. She was so willing to trust. I mean, th I think that's what's so amazing is that, in a way, for me, what Yelena represents is, in a way, that, that Soviet citizen that believed the actual literal language of the Constitution, uh, of the language and the rights that were written down that citizens actually had to make complaints, to appeal to authorities. She was one of those people that, in a way, just sort of read the Constitution and took it literally. And also and the international human rights commitments that Uzbekistan has signed up to. You know, she looks at those documents, she looks at, at the rights to free speech, assembly, association, religion, and, you know, someone who has a Russian background, she has an enormous amount of compassion and understanding uh, of people of all walks of life, uh, of all walks of life and religious backgrounds, and is willing to basically help anyone at the drop of a hat run to their house or run to wherever a detention or an arrest is taking place, witness it, write it down, and immediately communicate it to journalists and, and diplomats and anyone who will listen. And, you know, over the years, the authorities have tried to paint her as crazy, right? They've used this designation of psychiatric treatment to tarnish her image. And, and at times, you know, it, it has worked. They have managed in a way to sideline her in different periods. And I think that's one of the reasons that she was able to evade um, complete arrest and detention for long periods in a way that Uzbek authorities would say, well, you know, don't listen to her. She's, she's crazy. Huh. But I think what she did is she triumphed. She overcame that through through years and years of activism and of work and of organizing and of educating herself on, on rights and, and conventions and, and different projects, she gradually showed everyone that she was stronger than any of those sorts of, uh, of decisions or, or pronouncements by a corrupt system and, and just kept going. And over time, we saw that I think everyone came around and they said, yeah, Yelena Orlaiva is really incredibly serious. She's uh -huh. the exact opposite of what the Uzbek government paints her as and uh so i think we all we all respect her immensely and 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 want to see her free immediately uh, you know i was just watching a video uh of her bravely walking in the cotton fields trying to explain to people uh, why it is a violation of their rights to be forced as a cotton uh, laborer etc so omida uh, you had some interactions with her so why she does what she does and what's that she's motivated by she really believes in human rights that's why and uh, this is her motivation and um Especially in uh, Uzbek society, in the country like Uzbekistan, when people are living in such a fear, when people think one, uh, like think about one thing and say another thing, Yelena is uh, unique, and she is doing her work, her human rights work. She is doing independent monitoring transparently, so she never hides this her work, and she really believes, yeah, that uh, in human rights, in constitution, in declaration on human rights, and I think that, and this makes her very strong, and uh, and she doesn't afraid, so that's why she's so unique, I think that's why we're talking about her so, uh, so much, because she's not afraid, she's not afraid of being detained, of, of being beaten, like, she's just She's so strong, and uh, like sometimes I'm, I'm amazed, and I'm, I'm trying to tell her that maybe she shouldn't be so like strideful, but she insists that her work is important, and uh, she's so motivated and going to continue her work. That's why the Uzbek government has isolated her this day. Uh -huh. Unfortunately, we have to end our discussion, but before to do that, Bruce, uh, um, uh, in recent days, especially since uh, Mirziyoyev is in power as a president of Uzbekistan, is she the only uh, human rights activist being detained, or we have seen more similar cases? She's the only one I know of, which is certainly doesn't mean that there haven't been more detained. Mm -hmm. uh, but yes, yeah, she is, as far as I know, um, she's the only one that the Uzbek government has uh, messed with so far. Although we'll see, you know, I mean, the, the harvest, the planting season's coming up, and then we got the harvest season, and we'll see. But like I said, 
them forcibly committing her to a psychiatric ward, I think, sends a chilling message to, to anyone in Uzbekistan who's thinking that maybe uh, the change of leadership means that they have more opportunity to get out and demand uh, more respect for what are their what amounts of their basic rights. Um, you know, that if you go out, you could end up in a psychiatric hospital like Omida or even worse, uh, like some of these people who have just been let out after, you know, like I said, two decades in prison. So, uh, uh, you know, would, some things have changed under Mirzioya, but certainly the tolerance for uh, activism and criticism of the government don't seem to have changed. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much, Bruce Panier, for uh, insightful comments. Uh, Bruce Panier is the editor of Kishlok Uwazi Radio for Europe Radio Liberty Central Asia blog. Also, big thanks uh, Steve Severdlo, Human Rights Watch's Central Asia researcher, and Omida Niyazba, director of the Uzbek German Forum for Human Rights. Thank you very much for your time in touch, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you. Rahmat. Thank, Thank you. And this is it from me, Mohammed Tahir, host of the Majlis Radio for Europe Radio Liberties Central Asia podcast. Until next week, bye bye.